Hi everyone, this lesson is on the side effects and health consequences of corticosteroid use, especially systemic use. So corticosteroids or glucocorticoids as they are also referred to, they can have many different side effects and health consequences. So this is going to be part one. And in this lesson, we're going to discuss the health consequences on the musculoskeletal system, the endocrine system, the dermatological system, and the immune system. Before we talk about those health consequences, let's discuss how corticosteroids work and what conditions they treat. So some examples of corticosteroids include prednisone and methylprednisolone, and they mimic endogenous corticosteroids or glucocorticoids. So in our body, we actually produce our own glucocorticoids that act at certain times to relieve inflammation. So the ones that we're going to prescribe patients, again, we're talking more specifically systemic corticosteroids, they're going to be utilized to essentially act like endogenous steroids, but they're going to be taken at higher doses and higher levels than what our body would generally produce. Now, corticosteroids have anti-inflammatory and immunomodulatory functions. This is the reason why they're used. But the problem is they have many different functions and effects throughout the body. Some of them include effects on the bones, on the adipose tissue or the fat tissue, and their immunomodulatory and anti-inflammatory effects occur via their ability to affect the immune system. And more specifically, they inhibit NF-kappa B or nuclear factor kappa B. And suppressing NF-kappa B leads to a suppression of the transcription of pro-inflammatory cytokines. So there's a suppression of pro-inflammatory cytokines. There's also suppression of B cells and T cells. Prednisone also leads to apoptosis of T cells. So it has a lot of regulatory functions on the immune system. And so that is why prednisone and other corticosteroids are used for autoimmune conditions, for instance. So some of the conditions that corticosteroids can be used for include giant cell arteritis. So this is important, especially as soon as there's a clinical suspicion of giant cell arteritis, we're going to prescribe systemic steroids because it can help reduce the risk of blindness. Idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura, this condition leads to a suppression of platelet counts. So it's an autoimmune condition that leads to a suppression of platelets. In asthma exacerbations, it can also be utilized as well. And especially important, corticosteroids are going to be used to treat autoimmune exacerbations or flare-ups. So this can occur in conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, Crohn's disease, etc. And the reason I use autoimmune exacerbations or flare ups is because we generally try to avoid use of corticosteroids because they cause a variety of mild and or severe side effects in many different systems. So we try to use them sparingly. So we try to use systemic corticosteroids sparingly because of a lot of the health consequences we're going to discuss in the upcoming slides. So the first system we're going to discuss is the musculoskeletal system. Corticosteroids have an effect on bones and muscles. So when we look at the bones more specifically, corticosteroids can lead to or increase the risk of osteoporosis. So this is going to be a condition of reduced bone mineral density. It's going to be essentially thin bones. So if you were to look at the inside of a bone, it essentially hollows out and becomes thinner. This is going to be especially the case with chronic use of systemic corticosteroids and especially with higher doses as well. And the osteoporosis is going to lead to an increased risk of bone fractures. So hip fractures, rib fractures, etc. We can also see issues with osteonecrosis. Necrosis means death of the bone. So osteo means bone, necrosis means death. So more specifically, it's going to be related to avascular necrosis of especially the femoral head and or humeral head. So femoral head is going to be the hip joint and humeral head is going to be in the shoulder joints. So those are going to be the areas most affected. With regards to the femoral head, especially this is going to be the most common location for avascular necrosis, and this is because it is what we call a watershed area. Watershed areas where there is a particular blood supply that can be easily impacted or impeded. So this is the reason why we can get avascular necrosis. And we can also see myopathy in corticosteroid use. We call this corticosteroid-induced myopathy. And what we'll C is generally muscle weakness that generally occurs in proximal muscles. So it can affect most of the time hip muscles, but can affect the shoulder muscles as well. And it can often be painless at the beginning. We can just see weakness at first. And then over time, we can start getting muscle aches and pains. Now moving on to the endocrine system, we can see issues with increased appetite with regards to systemic corticosteroid use. So corticosteroids and our own endogenous cortisol, they act on the hypothalamus in the brain to stimulate appetite. And this can actually also not only stimulate appetite, but can reduce hypothalamic sensitivity to leptin. Leptin is going to be a hormone that our 
fat cells release to promote satiety, to make us feel full. So we can actually reduce the sensitivity of leptin as well. So it makes you feel more hungry and also suppresses a particular hormone that should suppress your appetite. So it would make you even more hungry. So we can see changes in appetite with high cortisol levels and conditions like chronic stress, glucocorticoid use, which is what we're discussing in this lesson, and in Cushing syndrome and Cushing's disease as well. Now we can also, along with this, see weight gain. So patients on corticosteroid use systemically, especially long-term, they can have weight gain. This is going to be due to increased appetite generally, but it can also be related to fluid retention and changes in fat distribution and corticosteroid-induced hyperglycemia, which we'll discuss in the upcoming slides. Hyperglycemia is going to be a high blood sugar level. This leads us into type 2 diabetes. So patients on systemic corticosteroids can have a higher risk of type 2 diabetes and insulin resistance, and especially with long-term use. So with longer term use, with higher doses, we can see risk of type 2 diabetes increasing. And then we can also see amenorrhea. Amenorrhea is going to be no menstruation. And it seems to be due to corticosteroids effects on the brain at higher doses, especially can inhibit the pulsatile release of gonadotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus. And a normal healthy release of GnRH is in a pulsatile fashion. If we don't have a proper pulsatile fashion, we will not have proper levels of LH and FSH. And both of these, and these hormones are involved in ovulation and the thickening of the endometrium. So if we don't have that occurring, we can have amenorrhea, no menstruation. Now let's discuss the dermatological effects of corticosteroid use. So one of them is fat redistribution. So what we can see here is that there can be fat pads that can accumulate in different parts of the body. Some of the classic places can include the upper back, abdomen, and the face. So we can have a rounded face and we can have a bump or a lump of fat on the back. And fat can be redistributed away from extremities. So what we can often see is that fat will be mobilized from extremities like arms and legs. So the arms and legs become thinner and then we get more fat in the face, in the back, and in the abdomen. So the fat kind of centralizes. We can also see thinning skin with corticosteroid use. This also applies with topical corticosteroids as well, especially long-term, and also especially in certain parts of the body if we use corticosteroids long enough. So thinning skin can occur, especially with chronic or prolonged use of prednisone or corticosteroids. So that redistribution of fat away from places like the extremities can make the skin appear thinner, but more specifically, the glucocorticoids can inhibit fibroblast activity. Fibroblasts create collagen and also can impact elastin functioning as well. So the skin loses collagen and thins out with use. So again, this can happen both systemically, but also topically as well. And we can also see ecchymoses. Ecchymoses is simply the medical term for larger sized bruises. And these bruises can be easier to occur due to the fact that the skin is thinner and there's reduced collagen. And then we can also see striae. So this is a very important dermatological finding in corticosteroid use and in also other high corticosteroid conditions like Cushing's syndrome or Cushing's disease, we can see striae as well. So striae are going to be stretch marks. And this is again going to be due to reduced collagen and elastin. So this can all be a part of the same process where the fat mobilizes from the extremities into the abdomen and the back, for instance. But especially in the abdomen, we can get a lot of abdominal fat and this stretches the skin. But because the skin now has reduced collagen and elastin, we can start to see stretch marks occurring. So that's why we can see striae or stretch marks. And they can often be quite numerous and quite thick as well. And then with regards to corticosteroids effects on the immune system, we can see an increased risk of infections. So use of corticosteroids leads to suppression of the immune system. This is part of the reason why they are used in the first place, but this increases the risk of all types of infections. We can see fungal infections. We can see more bacterial infections, more viral infections. Again, this is going to be especially with prolonged use and higher doses. So patients on systemic corticosteroids are at a higher risk for infections overall. And then we can also see other immune cell alterations, including neutrophilia, so higher levels of neutrophils and leukocytosis. And the reason for the higher levels of neutrophils is because of corticosteroids' ability to suppress neutrophil adhesion molecules. And neutrophil adhesion molecules are used by the neutrophils to exit the vasculature and enter into interstitial spaces and, and deal with bacterial infections, for instance. So if they're not able to leave the vasculature when blood is drawn or assessed, we can see that for some reason they have very high neutrophils, but that's the reason because of that reduced migration of the neutrophils. We can also see eosinopenia, which is low eosinophil counts. So 
corticosteroids suppress eosinophil levels, and corticosteroids also lead to apoptosis of lymphocytes, so T cells especially. So these are all going to be some of the immune cell alterations and consequences of corticosteroid use. In the next lesson, in part two, we'll discuss corticosteroid effects on the gastrointestinal system, on the cardiovascular system, and psychiatric effects of corticosteroids. And please consider joining as a member. Memberships are now available where we'll be discussing other members-only related topics. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. As always, thanks so much for watching. Have a great day and take care.